Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, in the back, can you hear me? Excellent, OK. So my name is Luke Melhauser. I'm the executive director of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, or MIRI for short. And uh, we are a nonprofit research institute just two blocks off the UC Berkeley campus on Addison Street. And uh, we're very excited to be hosting a uh, talk by Professor Nick Bostrom, who is the director of the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University, uh, or FHI for short. Miri and FHI collaborate regularly on research related to the subject of tonight's talk, machine superintelligence, um, and specifically the, you know, the challenge of getting good outcomes from machines that are cleverer and more powerful than we are. Uh, before we begin, I have just a couple comments on logistics. After the talk, you'll be able to buy a copy of the book, if you like, right out here at the table. Um, Nick's going to try to find some time to sign some of those copies. Um, second, if you'd like to learn more about this subject, Miri is actually running an online virtual reading group for this book, where we'll read through a section together uh, for one week, and then we'll discuss it in a forum, a particular internet forum online. Um, that might be the best way if you want to learn more about this stuff, because you can read it at the same pace as a bunch of other people, and you can discuss it with them online, section by section. Um, so if you want more info on that, you can just go to our website, intelligence.org, and there's a link on the homepage to the details for where the online reading group will be. Uh, and then third, if you are a researcher in computer science or logic, please do visit Miri's research page at intelligence.org and see whether any of the problems that we're working on are interesting to you and get in contact with us if, if they are. Um, we're always looking for more people who want to research the technical challenge in, uh, challenges in mathematics and computer science that come up when you try to figure out how to control a system that's cleverer than you are. Very interesting problems come up there. Um, so now I would like to introduce Berkeley computer science professor Stuart Russell. Professor Russell received his doctorate in computer science from Stanford University in 1984, uh, 86, pardon me. Um, and has been a faculty member at Berkeley ever since. He has won numerous awards and paper prizes, uh, published dozens of papers in top conferences and journals, and he's also the co-author with Peter Norvig of the leading AI textbook in the world um, that pretty much everyone uses at, at university. Um, and for many years, he's been asking the question, what if we AI scientists succeed at the goal of building AI? What happens then? Uh, I agree that's a very important question. Um, I, I'm glad he's been discussing it for a long time, and he's been recently organizing some panels and workshops on that question with other AI scientists. So, Professor Russell, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much, Luke. I'd like to thank Miri for organizing this visit. I'd like to welcome Nick Bostrom to Berkeley. Uh, as Luke said, Nick's a professor of philosophy at uh, my old University at Oxford, uh, where he directs the Future of Humanity <laughs> Institute. <laughs> um, and uh, Nick has a very eclectic background. Uh, he studied physics, he studied neuroscience, he studied uh, mathematical logic, he studied philosophy of science. Uh, and he was doing this trying to find out where the big questions were. Uh, and as a result of pursuing those big questions, uh, he's become one of today's most prominent philosophers. Uh, it's not just asking the big questions, it's actually answering the big questions. So Nick has provided, uh, as much as anyone, uh, has provided ways to think about these big questions that are productive and lead us, perhaps, to change the way uh, that we go about managing the human race, uh, which is all that you can really ask of a philosopher. Uh, so in particular, he's thought about uh, the question, uh, are we special just because we are the ones who are asking this question, uh, sometimes known as anthropic bias, uh, and its effect on our understanding of all kinds of things, including physics. Uh, are we living in a simulation? And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, what happened to all those billions of alien civilizations that must be out there? Did they all destroy themselves? And if so, was it because they developed artificial intelligence? Uh, so that's what Nick is going to address today. OK, so um, with that, I will turn over the podium to Nick and just say 
that my conversations with Nick have convinced me uh, much more than I was convinced before that this is, uh, as he puts it, the essential task of our age. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much all for, uh, for coming here. Um, um, I'm not gonna try to summarize the entire book, but what I wanted to try to do is to give some of the uh, background, like where is this coming from? How does it fit into a slightly wider perspective? Uh, and then towards the end of the presentation and maybe even more in the Q&A, we can then uh, delve into any particular more concrete uh, AI related topic that you might be interested in. Um, so if we take a step back and, and think about the human condition from a more abstract point of view, uh, we can conceptualize things uh, as in this graph where we maybe plot time on the x-axis and then on the y-axis some notion of capacity, level of technological advancement. And what we take to be the human condition, the normal way for things to be, um, if we think of it uh, a little bit is actually a very abnormal way for things to be. So it's certainly abnormal on a like evolutionary time scale. The human species is young. Um, it's even uh, abnormal on a historical time scale. This modern human condition where you wake up in the morning and you commute to work and sit in front of a screen all day and worry more about eating too much than too little is, is a huge anomaly in history. It's only like a few hundred years. Um, that we have escaped the Malthusian condition that characterized almost all of our past history, and even then just in parts of the world. Um, of course, we're also in an anomalous position in space, this little crust of our planet um, floating around in, in a vast ultra-high vacuum out there. So in many different ways, we are exceptional, and yet we tend to think that this is the way that things are, and that any hypothesis that suggests that we could uh, break out of this human condition is very radical and needs some extraordinary level of evidence. Uh, yet, the longer the time scale we are considering, the, the greater the probability that we will break out uh, out of this narrow band uh, in either of one or of two directions. So we could break out in the downwards direction. Um, in population biology, there is this concept of a minimum viable population size. If there are too few animals left of a species, uh, it dwindles out to extinction. But um, the human species is not uh, even though it's very different from other animals, not necessarily immune um, to going extinct. Um, and the thing with extinction is that once you are extinct, you tend to stay extinct. So uh, <laughs> it's an attractor in this picture. Uh, but I think that there is another attractor as well, which is if we succeed in breaking out in the upwards direction, um, if we reach uh, some kind of technological maturity where we can already see that there are like physically possible technologies such that if they are developed would enable uh, the colonization of, of space for Neumann probes, automated replicators that could go out. Um, and if we go out in that direction, then it might well be that there is also an attractor state, which is that our civilization continues to expand um, at some significant fraction of the speed of light indefinitely, or, or at least for, for billions of years until uh, at some point, further acquisitions of physical resources becomes impossible be because of the cosmological expansion. So there's this finite bubble of stuff that somebody starting from, from our current uh, point in space-time could access. And the long-term destiny, if we break out in the uh, upwards direction, might be that we gradually approach that. Um, and that uh, the, the risk of uh, suffering an existential catastrophe would at that point go down. Um, this concept of an existential risk, it's defined as one that either involves the extinction of Earth-originating intelligent life or the permanent and drastic destruction of our potential for further desirable development. So it's a way that we could prematurely end uh, the human story or alternatively a way that we could permanently destroy the future. Almost all of the things that can go wrong and that have gone wrong are not in this special category. In fact, there had never been an existential catastrophe. And there will only, at the end of history, have been either zero or one of these. Um, but yet the concept, I think, is important because 
if one has a certain view of value where the 